House of Ed Tech, episode 54. I'm Miles, and you're listening to the House of Ed Tech with my daddy, Chris Nitty. This episode of the House of Ed Tech is brought to you by Audible.com. You can get two free audiobooks of your choice and choose from over 180,000 topics. To get your two free downloads and a 30-day free trial, go to chrisnessy.com slash audible. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Christopher Nessie. And the House of EdTech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. My objectives include discussing technology that is changing our classrooms and schools and sharing tools and tips that you can hear about today and use tomorrow. I talk to teachers, leaders, and creators just like you and have them share their stories. The purpose? Whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way we teach and how our students learn. And welcome back inside the House of Ed Tech. Of course, I am Chris Nessie. And let's get right to it. Welcome back to the podcast, Caitlin. Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day, sweetie. Happy Valentine's Day. It's exciting. It is exciting because you and I, we just celebrated our little Valentine's event and of course, without a doubt, we... Included fondue. Yes, we had some fondue. We love fondue. Well, I have to tell people, we only do fondue for Valentine's Day. And we don't do fondue out at a restaurant, but we do fondue at home. And that's the way we can justify keeping our fondue pot for about 10 years now. Yeah. Because we, we don't do it any other time. <laughs> it's uh, it's delicious. We had... Bees. We had bread with cheese. We yes. forgot before it went, the apples... Yes, we just gave up on the apples and vegetables this year and just went with bread and cheese because that's all we like to eat anyway. Of course. And uh, for uh, dessert, dessert, we had... Chocolate and uh, like a hazelnut chocolate and marshmallows and brownies. It was delicious. So we totally went. <laughs> we totally didn't eat anything healthy whatsoever. No broccoli, no apples, no carrots, no No steak, no chicken, no shrimp. <laughs> Nothing that was uh, anybody would be proud of. But it was good because it was just me and you by the fire. Yes. It's nice and quiet. So, but anyway, so this is the House of Ed Tech. <laughs> yes. So that's what happened in the House of Ed Tech today. Yeah. So this episode, we're going to have, of course, an Ed Tech thought where we're going to talk a little bit about Twitter. And I have an Ed Tech recommendation. And I have a very special House of Ed Tech VIP. This is going to be a first. But first, Caitlin, the last time you were on the show, we talked about the things that we do that are frugal and a lot of the ways that we live our life. And I've gotten a lot of positive feedback. You weren't able to be on the last episode right out of that one, but I've continued to get some really great feedback on the episode. So I'm going to play some audio feedback All because right. people are talking nice it. about you. Yeah. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> uh, first up is Tina Monteleone. She's a New Jersey educator and she had this to say. Tina, I'm listening to the House of Ed Tech, and I just want to tell you how much I'm enjoying this real conversation that you're having with Danny right now, back and forth. We don't have that kind of conversation between um, all this other information and stuff we're talking about in education. We don't talk about the costs it takes for us to better ourselves, to, to move on, to get to higher um, educational status. Um, sometimes... We're not sure when to do that. I mean, I am, in fact, closer to being Danny's parents' age than you. And I can tell you, even at this point, I'd love to get more uh, grad education, but I have two kids that are going to be in college. So, you know, even now it's a struggle to make those decisions. But I, I love your advice to her. Um, and now is better than never. So carpe diem on that. Um, keep this real convo going because... Educators need to, to talk about these kinds of things, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate you. Have a good one. That's awesome. I love it. She, it's it's great that people are interested in that aspect of being an educator, because I think that's a huge piece of it. I mean, a lot of us, for what we enjoy doing and um, the work that we enjoy doing, you know, basically it is 
the service to the community, we give up a lot in that process. You know, oftentimes we give up possibly double the salary in order to do what we do. Um, yet we still work those extra hours and the long time and put a lot in and we're more high, highly regarded when we have a higher education. So yeah. <laughs> the more you gain, which costs money, which you don't always make as an educator, um, you know, it's kind of like a double edged sword. So, and, and Tina was commenting on advice I gave to Danny, Danny the last Kenis, who sent in feedback that was on the last episode and Danny had wanted to know about, should she, while not having kids yet, should she spend the money and go back to school to get another advanced degree above her master's, whether it's supervisor, educational leadership. And without you telling me, I gave her the advice of go for it. Yeah, I I would agree with that. Um, I'm definitely glad that I got my master's degree in post-grad education before we had our first child. Um, I plan to go back for more, of course, because I just love to be, I love to be a lifelong learner. But, um, yeah, it was definitely worth it to get that out of the way and get the cost out of the way so that once we were ready, you know, and it didn't, I mean, I did it within one year. I did an entire master's program. So not everybody's as extreme as I am, but, you know, four classes a quarter, it, <laughs> 60 credits later, I made it through. <laughs> hey, I, I'm experiencing just a small taste of that with the two classes I'm taking now. Oh, yeah, because the eight eight weeks. Weeks. Yeah, I had 10 week uh, quarters and it was pretty intense at Drexel. So we do have another piece of audio feedback, but okay. if you'd like to connect with Tina, she is on Twitter and her username is Tina Monte, T-I-N-A-M-O-N-T-E, and she's a fantastic educator who you should be connected with. Uh, next up, we have some audio feedback from Mr. Adam Jones, and I will let him, in his little feedback, introduce himself, and then we can talk about what he has to say. Hey, Chris, this is Adam Jones from the Adam Jones Education Podcast. That's not all I am, certainly. Uh, independent school teacher, educator at Proctor Academy up in New Hampshire. And um, I've enjoyed your show at a distance for, I don't know, some time now. And I just came across um, your most recent episode, which had some recommendations. And then I actually, from there, got connected back to the one you did with your wife, um, Kate about finances and it was just great to hear and listen my wife and I are in a very similar a very similar philosophies in a similar position um, so useful to hear how you guys are thinking and doing and how lucky you are to have a wife like that that understands all the ins and outs and can plan and create the space for you to create the way you want to create it's pretty awesome um, what a true gift um, so I wanted to give you that feedback thank you so much that's awesome see you're a very lucky man I was just going to say, see, I, I, I know I'm lucky and other people know that I'm lucky no, that's, too. That's really cool. You know, I think too, uh, especially when you work in education, I think a lot of times you end up with people in a similar profession. So, you know, I mean, there are a lot of people I know who have husbands or wives who work in private employment or, you know, make more money and they're able to do what they do. But I think a lot of times, I mean, we've found over the years that even a lot of our friends have cha- kind of changed over to being in education or higher education or, um, You know, because that's just who you're around. So I feel like oftentimes you end up kind of gravitating towards the same passions and interests, uh, which is cool. But again, when it comes to finances, it doesn't always work out as as easily as it does for, you know, say if you had two people in the financial sector or something like that. And, And the part of Adam's feedback that I chopped off because it came in a couple of weeks ago was he and I then started talking about his podcast and his podcast, the Adam Jones Education Podcast, is going to be coming on to the Education Podcast Network. Super awesome. I know. Um, so for those that don't know, I am the founder of the Education Podcast Network, and you can get connected to more great content like this podcast, soon to be the Adam Jones Ed Podcast, and a, and a cast of others uh, over on edupodcastnetwork.com. And by all means, please connect with Adam. Check out his podcast. He's on Twitter at Adam Jones ED and his website is the same Adam Jones ED.com. Um, thank you guys for the great feedback. Uh, Caitlin feedback is good, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I actually got some in-person feedback from a few people that know us personally and actually listen to your show. Um, so a coworker of mine, you know, like he was totally into it and totally like 
it was great to see the light bulbs go off. And he was like, yes, this is great. And he started doing my research. And in a personal conversation, we talked about some other um, online tools. I had mentioned um, You Need a Budget that I've read on a lot of blogs. So that's something else you can check out if you're starting to come up with a budget. Um, I know people use mint.com, um, but I didn't like mint because it really just deals with what's coming in and what you're spending. It's not really creating a whole budget ahead of time. So you're just tracking what you've spent, which is great to know where it's going, but you kind of want to have a plan for it when it gets to you. So, Well, for some people, that's half the battle. Like Some people don't know where their money goes. Yeah. I mean, we started years ago. We Remember we got those little notebooks from like the dollar store? I'm looking at a little <laughs> notebook on my desk right now. Yeah. You know, we got the little notebooks from the dollar store and I was like, here's your cash allowance. Write down everything you spend it on, you know, just so you have an idea of what you're actually buying and where the money goes instead of two weeks later going, I don't know where all my money went. I need more money for gas. Um, yeah. So it was kind of cool to kind of have those in-person conversations and get some feedback. And from that, I, for a while now, I've been thinking about starting a new blog and kind of an offshoot of my personal blog that has gotten a lot of attention in certain categories. So I actually just started and launched as of, um, yesterday the frugalmomster.com so it's uh, frugal f r u g a l and momster m o m s t e r so frugalmomster.com so i'm going <laughs> to i feel like it's like the hulk or something <laughs> um but yeah i mean i was toying with ideas and and i really wanted to write more about our financial situation so i guess um, you know, I've been putting it together and it's actually been a long process to kind of get the website up and running and hosting and, and coding and all this other lovely, wonderful things. Um, and there's still more changes to come, but I just wanted to kind of get it out there and get it started. And already I have some friends who have read some of my frugal posts everywhere else. And they're like, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be great. Like, can't we see what you write? So I'm going to bring some stuff over from my personal blog that I know has been useful, uh, since the last three or four years that I've been posting and then start with some new stuff and kind of keep it going. I mean, I feel like in our everyday lives, everything we do kind of comes back to that frugal quality kind of process. And katenessie.com is still going to be there, still doing yes, photography. Yeah, there's katenessie.com for photography. I have blog.katenessie.com. It's my personal blog. Um, you know, so you can read all about life, food, fitness, and photos. And then this is going to be a little piece of the world where I can write a little bit more about personal finance and kind of my my main thing for it is I want it to be frugal living for the modern family. So a lot of frugal blogs I read are very extreme. Um, there's like extreme retirement. There's extreme, you know, we want to be financially independent by the time we're 33 and live in a homestead in the woods kind of blogs. And I just want people to you know, for me, that's not realistic. I don't want to go live and churn my own butter. You don't want to build um, a cabin in upstate Vermont? <laughs> yeah, no, not really. Um, too much snow, too cold. Especially with it being like negative 17 tomorrow here in New Jersey, which is going to be weird. But um, so my goal for this is kind of basically frugal living for the modern day family. Like you want to go to work, you want to do your thing, you want to explore your passions and and uh, get your finances in order so you can retire or help take care of your children or whatever you need to do. But you're not looking for an extreme experience and where you pretty much want to be like off the grid and buy an island. I mean, I would love that, but um, I'd love to buy an island because it'd be warm. But <laughs> I'd love to be on an island with but yeah, you. Yeah, so the focus is for kind of like the everyday person and family. Um, you know, to me, family could be just a husband and wife or, you know, you and your media family or you and kids or you and pets, you know. So that's uh, that's my goal for it. It's just to kind of share things that you can do with your family, with your household, with your, you know, every aspect that we kind of talked about last time and realistic stuff that's not deprivation and you're feeling like, oh my God, this is crazy. I have we, to... we don't want people to feel like they have to jump off a cliff to be financially savvy. No, you shouldn't have to live miserly. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be, live miserly. You know, you can find quality. So. That is what I've recently started, so I hope to grow now, that. And the, the part that I'm excited about with Frugal Momster, again, that's frugalmomster.com. Uh, that's how I do it. <laughs> uh, is the fact that there also may be some other media element that goes along with this podcast, and I'm really excited that maybe I can push you over that cliff out of your comfort zone and 
help you with that. So well, that's really I exciting. can say that so far this has been out of my comfort zone. So I'm getting there. But you're okay. You've been here twice. <laughs> you're smiling both times. So well, this is a lot nicer. You know, the first time I was in another room on a laptop doing like Skype, and the audio was terrible. I didn't even want to listen to myself afterwards because it just was horrible. So it's actually nice now being able to talk to you across the desk, and the audio is great. You know, I even listened to the whole episode because I usually don't like my voice. So, uh, you know, it was. I'm I'm getting into the groove. I'm starting to feel uh, some of this audio stuff. I'm more of a visual person, hence the photography and videography and cinematography. But um, and I'm definitely a writer. Well, not because but, it's Valentine's Day, but you've got a face and a visual for video, whereas I'm more suited for podcast and radio. <laughs> no, no. So. Again, just to wrap up this feedback portion, sure. um, I'm still working on this new segment, so I'm, I'm going to, I don't want this to sound desperate, but in order for my new segment where I answer your questions, I'm talking to you, the listener, <laughs> uh, send me your ed tech questions or your tech questions. Uh, even if you want to send a question for Kate to answer, she can sure, get right back here it. in the studio. I would love it. Um, you can tweet us a question using the hashtag house of ed tech. Uh, Kate's Twitter is Kate Nessie. Mine is Mr. Nessie. Uh, or you can call the House of EdTech feedback hotline, and that number is 732-903-4869. Or you can get me on Voxer, where my username is Mr. Nessie. I can tell you, you'd be so excited. He loves getting feedback and questions, and that's what it's all about. We're here to answer and help people. Absolutely. We're teachers. That That's what it's that's all about. Um, so, th- so that's feedback. Uh no new patrons to speak of, but of course, uh, a huge thank you to my current awesome supporters. Uh, if you're interested in supporting this podcast uh, in a different way other than feedback and iTunes reviews, then by all means, I invite you to go and check out chrisnessy.com slash awesome, where you can find out more about how you can contribute to the show on Patreon. Uh, the support I'm currently receiving, I'm proud to say, is now helping to support this podcast on Libsyn. So... I can I can host the files on Yay. a great media site. <laughs> um, and also because of this, I am currently working on building a new chrisnessy.com, which will be a self-hosted WordPress website. So I'm very excited about that. Yes, I just went through that with two sites, so I can help you. And I'm no dummy. I let <laughs> you a, do it first. <laughs> it's a long process, and I did it five times over. So. <laughs> and, and, and Frugal Momster looks great. Your new blog looks great. Yeah, so. it's getting there. I'm still picking through some podcast related themes that'll make the the experience for you who's listening when you come to the website and you're checking out show notes, it'll be a much more pleasurable experience for you. And once that new site is ready, of course, I will announce it here on the show or you may find it first before I say something on here. Uh, One feature that is active uh, is some cleaner, pretty linking. So for example, beginning with this episode, number 54 if you want to get right to the show notes, you can go to chrisnessy.com slash 54, as Woo-hoo. in episode 54. <laughs> You've wanted to do that for two years now. <laughs> I've been waiting. And, and, and the way I said it, I, I borrowed it from uh, from my semi-internet friend, Jeff Sanders. Oh, there you go. I love the Jeff. the 5 a.m. miracle. Jeff is an awesome guy. Him is kombucha. Yes. <laughs> uh, some Although, other... if he was an educator, his miracle would have to start at 3 a.m. Yes. And, and, and I told him that because <laughs> yes, I got the opportunity you... to speak with him. Yes. Uh, the other thing news wise is if you've been paying attention on Twitter, hashtag shift ed has premiered now shift ed and Caitlin, you're going to hear this for the first time, not because we haven't talked about it, but it's exciting. Uh, shift ed is a positive chat that covers the real topics in education. This is not uh, a forum for complaining and whining about what you don't like about education, but it's also not a place where we're just going to pat each other on the back and, uh, you know, have the same old stuff. I was just wanted to find out, was this what you were blab, 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 blabbing about the other day? This is one of the blabbing, blab, blab, blab <laughs> When things. I had come in, I was like, what is this now? So this is a new blab show, slash it's probably going to become a podcast that you can download. Great. Um, but in its basic form, it's a roundtable discussion with Adam Schoenbart, Danny Kennis, AJ Bianco, Stacey Lindis, Chrissy Romano, and myself. Uh, but most importantly, you who is listening. You can join us every two weeks on blab.im and you can share your positive ideas and solutions to some of education's burning questions and hot button topics. Uh, As we record and release this, 
uh, on February 13th, and this is released on Valentine's Day. The next Shift Ed will take place on February 16th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Now, if you're listening to this after, just add the hashtag Shift Ed to your Twitter client and follow the conversation and find out when we're going to be on blab.im having this conversation. That's pretty cool. I think that's great. I think it's cool that you're going to make it into a potentially a podcast. And I also want to remind people that if they go there and be a part of it, they can chat with the Ed Justice League. Yeah. <laughs> they can talk to real superheroes. How cool Ed, is that? Ed, your heroes. Are you guys going to like wear your costumes? Well, you should I, wear your costumes sometime. Just just throwing it out there. Well, you know more often than not, I am wearing a Superman t-shirt of some yeah, well, kind. I think 90% of the shirts you own are Superman. And on video right back here. <laughs> so <They're> Superman. <laughs> for an audio podcast, you can't see this, but right behind me. I do have my Superman yeah. adult collectible action figure. I like Shift Ed, and it's it's kind of like Shifted. Yes. You know, and we're, you're shifting the mindset of we're education. We're making Shift happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Um, also, Newswise Supervisor Program, as we release this, two weeks to go. I'll be done on February 29th. Thank you. Then I can apply <laughs> to the state of New Jersey for my supervisor certification. Which would be great. Off we go on that journey. Um. Now, here's something that's very special. What I called, and I told you about this already, Kate, but yes. I'm interested for you to share your thoughts here on the show. Uh, this week, I hit the education home run. Yes, you did. I, you I did it even, all in one week. I did it all in one week. As people may or may not know, uh, I work in a high school. That's my day job. And this semester, as you know, I'm teaching at Rutgers. So on Monday nights, I'm teaching a college course. Professor Nessie. Professor Nessie in the house. And this Friday, uh, this Friday, it was Friday, this past Friday, the start of my four day president's day weekend, didn't have school. And I got to go to Miles's elementary school in his pre-K class. And Miles is three. He'll be four in a couple weeks. And I got to read a story to his pre-K class. So I got to interact from college all the way down to someone's first year. You could in also school. add post-grad cause you're still taking post-grad courses. And I'm still a student. Yes. So you pretty much could. You've covered the gamut of education completely. Teacher and student. <laughs> in every aspect. But that was really cool to go to his class. And what he was excited as anything when I walked oh, in the yeah. room. Oh, yeah. Because uh, he has two teachers. So one of the teachers came to the office to get me. Oh, okay. And, you know, Very she escorted me guest. down. It was <laughs> great. And everybody walked in and, and I heard kids say, that's your daddy, Miles? Yeah. <laughs> I heard all about because I went to the uh, Valentine's party at the end of the day to help out. And, yeah, uh, it I was, was all about well. the Nessies on Friday. Uh, at the yeah, school. they were like, "This is great." We got you know Mr. Nessie in the morning and Mrs. Nessie in the afternoon, and I had to do the same dances that you did all morning with the kids after your reading, and heard all about your excitement. And uh, the teacher was happy to have us both there to help out. Well, I read the story as as only I could do it. I can only imagine. So, I mean, I was asking the kids questions. They were answering questions as we were doing the story. A true elementary librarian. Yeah, but but as as I've said many times, there's a reason I don't teach at this level because ultimately I would just play with them. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you would just have fun all day long. Although You'd be like, are... would that, is that like uh, the kindergarten cop guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> um, so that's all the upfront stuff. So why don't we get into the EdTech Thought. So this episode's EdTech Thought I have titled, Why Do You Favorite Things on Twitter? Because I'm really at a loss. Now, Caitlin, you're, you're a Twitter user like me, and from time to time we click the heart and, you know, we like something, we favorite it. And... I always do it with a purpose. You know, I, I yeah. If, if it's a link, um, but I'm finding more often than not that people are favoriting things and I can't figure out why. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if they're favoriting it because um, people are just so used to liking things like on Facebook. So it's a way to just let you know, like, hey, yeah, it's cool. I favorite as well with a purpose. Like I don't have a lot of favorites. And when I do favorite, it's something that I legit want to remember like whether it's a quote or a link to something i want to go back and be able to say okay let me go back and like save this somewhere else um you know or retweet it or whatever so usually i don't favorite things very often 
it's more of a list of like, okay, this is important. I want to not miss this, but I don't have the time to like link it and share it and, you know, or save it somewhere to go back to later. So it's just a quick like, okay, let me come back to it later. Um, but yeah, I found, because even some just random things I've posted that really don't warrant any sort of attention. Like, no, people, like sometimes I'll wonder, like, why did I even tweet that? And yet four or five people like that I tweeted it. Yeah, they kind of favored it. And I'm like, really that was worth favoring so yeah i'm not i'm not quite sure i i'm curious as to why people do favor things on twitter or is it like a liking thing to just let you know like hey it's cool i mean i know it's voxer now has the hearts too and you know and it's kind of to me i'm like okay i really need to like something you just sent to me we're having a conversation like of course i like you i'm talking to you <laughs> yeah, and, and when you and with voxer and, and the heart or the whatever they're calling it on voxer i mean if you don't have the pro account it's not like that's going to save that forever eventually yeah it'll... yeah so it's just kind of like or like the other day i hearted something and i'm like oh wait but i never responded to the person <laughs> like i just hearted it i'm like does she even know i hearted it what does it matter um yeah so i've noticed that too with some things or just random things i'm like that does that deserve a favor i totally get the liking like on facebook you know oh i like that i like that although i think even that's kind of gotten a little bit um and people just like things and I don't even think. Well, we all know with Facebook, the whole thing is where's the dislike button been for the last 12 years? Yeah. But then, yeah. But then you run into problems. Like if you write something and people are like dislike, you know, it's like, well, what do you mean? Do you dislike what I said or do you dislike that this happened to me? Like, <laughs> or do you, you know what I mean? Like, or people sh share something that's sad and people like it. Yeah. It's just, you know, you know like, I, oh, my family member is in the hospital and like 50 people like it. Like, yeah. Oh, like, it's like, what's like, the point we, of that? Yeah. It's kind of. Does it make sense? I think the only place where it feels like natural to like things is like Instagram. Like, I like that photo. I like whatever that, like, to me, that feels natural. Maybe it's because I'm a photographer, but I just feel like that's one of the more natural places where I see something and I'll click the heart and it's like truly like, yes, I like this. And I'm letting you know I like it. Um, you know, it's not for saving it for any purposes and it's not for, I don't know. I just feel like the like button kind of also loses translation and interaction because it's like oh i just like it and then i don't have to worry about like interacting with you it's very passive like is yeah it, i think it's caused us to become very passive i mean i, I have a column I should just walk around all day with the like button like on my finger like 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 you and then you're poking people and then that's all sorts of other issues <laughs> <That's> weird <laughs> uh, but like in tweet deck i have a column for things i favorite that i can quickly refer back to but i also use if this then that the mm -hmm. things i favorite again with a purpose and intentionally oh that's and, and again, I'm, I'm, to be full disclosure, I do sometimes favorite things exactly for the reasons I'm complaining about. Yeah, well, I don't even think it's complaining. I think we're just kind of curious. Like, we're almost asking the question, not so much of everybody else, but even ourselves. Like, why yes. do we favorite things? And we try to do it with a purpose, but it doesn't always end up that way. Like, and sometimes I'm like, oh, I it. liked it, but what does it matter? But the things that I do, like, if it's a link or an article or something I want to make sure that I hold on to. Yeah, yeah. It's going into an Evernote note for yeah, me. Yeah, thank I mean if this and that is a huge lifesaver. I use it for so many things. I save a lot of things in spreadsheets and documents and everywhere. So I I, I guess the moral of the story is favorite with a purpose. Yeah, and well, you know, send in feedback. I'd be curious to know why do you like things on Twitter? Do you just do it passively? Is it to let somebody know that you liked what they did or is it to save it for some purpose? I'd like to know like what people why you are just they want to come back things? on the show, but that's that's perfect. <laughs> you like having me on the show. I do. And of course, when I tweet out the episode, please like and favorite it on Twitter. There you go. Yes, <laughs> like it, even if it's passive. And, and then tell us it. about being passive and liking the episode. <laughs> Absolutely. So I guess that is this episode's EdTech Thought. Now for this episode's EdTech recommendation. This recommendation I found on Richard Burns' Free Technology for Teachers website, and it's called MicNote, M-I-C-N-O-T-E. MicNote is a free Chrome app that allows you to create voice recordings, text notes, and image-based notes on one concise notebook page. The notes that you record with your voice can be timestamped by clicking on your MicNote page while you're recording, and you can also take notes without recording any audio. All notes support the inclusion of images and links. And the best part of MicNote is that you can sync all of your notes to your Google Drive or your Dropbox account. 
Some applications for education include using mic note as a good tool for students who want to or need to record a teacher giving a short presentation. Students could also let the recorder run while they type their own notes about what the teacher is saying to the class. And because mic notes supports pictures, students could insert images of slides or include diagrams that their teachers display. And mic note also has the potential to be a good tool for students conducting interviews as they write timestamp notes while recording and conducting an interview. There'll be a link to mic note in the Chrome web store in the show notes for this episode. And thank you to Richard Byrne for sharing and writing up a great description. And also if you head over and I'll link to it, if you head over to free technology for teachers, Richard Byrne's site, he has a great video screencast about how this program works. And that is this episode's EdTech recommendation. Now, Caitlin, you are still sort of in the hot seat as a guest slash co-host of the show, but professionally, you are doing a lot of great things in your high school media center, and you've recently undergone like a redesign and you've revamped, revamped a lot of things in your library. Talk a little bit about what you're doing in your media center. Uh, well, we're just kind of bringing it up to date, adding more technology pieces. Um, about a year ago, I started there a year ago on, it'll be Tuesday. Um, it's my one year anniversary. I feel but, bad that I don't have some awesome sound effects queued up. I'm <laughs> really slapping myself for this. Um, so when I started there, uh, it's great and supportive and, and everybody's been awesome. And I like to kind of work in a library. This is probably my fourth or fifth library. I've kind of redesigned, um, a few I've redesigned completely. Other ones I've redesigned slightly and some were just kind of decided for me and kind of put in my lap. But um, it was nice to kind of come in and be able to just kind of assess the situation and kind of have a couple months before budgets and purchase orders and everything had to be sent out for the summer and really kind of figure out what I can do to kind of upgrade and change and, and kind of meet everybody where they're at. So I was going to say, if you could give a little background as to the situation you walked into, again, past the midway point of the year, Go into a little bit yeah, of that Yeah, yeah. Well, I started, you know, in February. So it was, you know, and, and the previous librarian had retired already and they were, you know, it took a long time for them to find me. And um, Good thing they did. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm excited that they did and it, everybody there is awesome. So anyway, so I kind of came in mid-year and there wasn't really a librarian there for a while. So I, I had heard mixed things that, you know, there's high over daily subs at times. There kind of was, um, you know, staff members that did things. So I kind of walked into everything being, um, which I anticipated um, being uh, wiped out, I should say. You know, I didn't. I came in, I didn't have a pen, I didn't have a stapler, I didn't have a piece of tape. Um, you know, so I came in my first day and I got a sub key because, <laughs> like, nobody was prepared for me. And, um, you know, because they had just had their winter break. So everybody was like, what, you're here? And I'm like, yes. So, um you know, so I came into just kind of like, all right, let me just see what's going on and let me observe the situation. And, um, you know, I had to take my pen out of my purse and my notebook and stuff. And then finally, you know, they, they helped me out and got me a hole puncher and all sorts of things kids needed. But um, so I was able to kind of take a couple weeks, which I always, you know, say to administrators, like, let me come in and see what how it's being used currently and then how we want to make it used and, and what we want to do in the process. So, um, you know, they gave me that time to just be free to, to kind of just come in every day and see how it was being used for a couple months and come up with how I know libraries to, to run well and how I've worked in really successful libraries. Um, one of the high schools I worked in was awesome. We were two floors. We had two librarians. I mean, I learned a lot from the head librarian there. And I try to like emulate that and a lot of what I do, the things that I saw that were really positive. So I was able to um, figure out kind of what I wanted. And well, I came into... See? What is it that you saw? Well, I, I, I you know, I, it's, for me, it's a couple things. It's it's function. So I came in and I noticed immediately the furniture and things there were, it wasn't open, it wasn't accessible. Um, you know, it was just kind of closed off and, and that's the way it was designed, you know, when they built the the space, I, you know, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So, 
you know, there wasn't a free flowing feel for teachers to circulate. It was even hard for me if I had to go talk to a student, you know, and they were across a table of 12 computers that was covered, you know, and, and 12 on the other side and their opposite ends, like you get there, you know, three minutes later, <laughs> walking all the way down. Um, you know, it's a lot of old, large furniture that just took up a lot of space, didn't really provide any function and form to how people are using technology now. And, um, you know, the, the technology was a bit outdated, um, you know, and, and they were moving into Google Apps. So it was like, okay, this is great. We're going Google. Like, well, how can I make this happen? So um, to the gasp of librarians out there, I forewent buying books <laughs> this year and I decided to buy all new Chromeboxes um, because I figured if I wait another year or two or just kind of wait for somebody else, like I'm not one to wait for other people to make the decisions. You know, I'll, I'll ask for permission or I ask for forgiveness afterwards. Um, but a lot of times I'll go and I'll say, you know, this is on me. So if this fails, you know, you totally can blame me. And usually it doesn't because I've done it before. So, but the Chrome boxes <sighs> were new. So yeah, for people so, that don't know, what is a Chrome box? A Chrome box is basically a, uh, Chromebook, you know, it's a Chrome, um, browser on, in a box. That's like, <laughs> I mean, it's the Chrome browser in a box. Um, you know, it's this little lightweight thin box, kind of like, you know, little HP things. So, but it's and, not a laptop. It's not a notebook. It's yeah, like and a we, little it, desktop like, yeah. that runs so, the Chrome. Yeah. So we had monitors already that were in great shape. And um, so we had about, they were, they were using, uh, and they still currently are kind of in the midst of Google Apps plus ClassLink. So they were using ClassLink, ClassLink thin clients and... I went and I was like, okay, let me find Chrome boxes. I contacted our company rep and, and, uh, basically I found a Chrome box that was like the most advanced at the time, as well as it came with a keyboard and mouse, which was perfect because that's all I needed. And I bought those. We're still, um, working on printing solutions and, and situations. So I still have some class link computers set up. Um, one of the first things I did there before even getting new computers, I set up a, um, quick print station by the printer because I noticed a lot of students were coming in just to print but they'd kind of intermingle with the class students and then you know they get off track they're high school students you know I'm sure we've all been there so now they come in and I'm like oh do you need to print just go to the quick print station now they even just go there you know now they've been there for a year they kind of know it's there and, and so it's right near the printer right near the door so there's no real like I'm coming in and I'm getting lost in the shuffle and 20 minutes later you know a teacher's coming down saying is so-and-so here you know and being in a large school, you know, I don't know everybody personally yet. Um, you know, that'll take a couple of years <laughs> to get to know every single student. But, um, yeah, so I, you know, I created the quick print station. I try to reorganize the furniture to make it more of a, a workspace area and kind of focus the students in on, like, you know, you're here to work. I wanted to have a college library feel that, you know, you're here to work and get things done and, and focus while you're in the library. So I did that. And um, so... Once I was able, the next year's budget was available. It was like, put in my order for Chrome boxes, and I ordered. We ended up getting an extra 10 because I was like, all right, you know, I, I created a whole design. I worked with um, Demco Interiors and our rep, and I had them kind of design. I had, the, I mean, the staff at, at my school district is awesome. I had the maintenance people help measure things, and we sent all sorts of stuff away. And I'm still working with the company to, you know, because we're kind of doing it piecemeal and slowly bringing things in. And as money comes available, like, hey, can we do it for that? So the computers and tables were um, completely, well, the computers were completely for my budget. I was like, okay, I'm just going to spend a little bit of money on books and totally go for new computers. Because if I have a library that doesn't have technology that's functioning, I don't really have a library. <laughs> so. And the whole point is to have a place where kids can come and teachers yeah, can come they, and learn yeah, and do they, stuff. Yeah, and I mean, teachers use it tremendously and students all day long. I mean, there's never there's never time where somebody's not in the library. So I focused in on the computers. Then I thought, okay, I got tables and chairs later. It turned out that I had great support. So I got some money for um, tables. And then I worked with the technology department. The design is actually different than the original 15 designs I went through. Um, you know, and I worked with with them to figure out the best layout and how things would work with the the floor internet ports and what our options were. And then, um, it was awesome. I was then told, Hey, we got a little bit extra money and I was like, great, I can get new chairs. So we have some really cool, um, you know, school colors and try to bring that in. I put in some stuff for next year to get, you know, new painting and, you know, hopefully we can kind of keep the changes 
going along, but I've already seen a positive response from um, staff and students and administrators, you know, just the way that the library is being used and the function. So for me, when I go into a library in a school, I really just want to experience what what they're using it for, how they're using it, and kind of assess the situation in being there day after day. And then saying, hey, this is what we need to do. This is what we can forego. This is what we can wait on and kind of prioritizing. So, you know, next year I have a huge budget put aside now to increase databases. I've started teaching more classes because I can I can now host um, up to two classes in the library. So, you know, I can say, hey, you know, bring your classes in or I can teach research. So I'm really excited because the last couple of weeks I've been teaching a lot of research courses for the English department. Um, you know, and I, I think since there was somebody who retired and, and there wasn't anybody there for a little while, people were kind of like, you know, they started to forget about the library. It kind of was like, ah, oh, it's just a place where like I can send a kid to go print out a paper, but not really for anything more. So got new book displays going and a lot of people are really getting into the stuff I've ordered. So it's kind of exciting. It's, it's great to see it kind of come alive. And I've gotten a lot of feedback from staff where they're like, you know, it's great that you're here. It's so like, it has a function and a purpose and everything in it. And it's great to have that. So, and you know, the next couple months I still have more projects to do and moving a lot of things, um, again, form and function, you know, moving DVD collections for staff that are currently hidden in drawers out to where they can get to it. Um, you know, so that even if I'm not there, like I don't, you know, I don't ever want a teacher to come to the library and be like, well, I can't get to something, you know, because it's not my resources. The library isn't mine. It's mine to manage. It's my, mine to caretake, but it's, it's the students, it's the staff, it's the administration, it's everybody's space. So I always keep that in mind in everything I do. Everybody's welcome there. Everybody, you know, is there to use it as you know, and obviously I'm, my biggest rule, I always tell everybody is respect, you know, respect the space, respect your librarian, respect other people. And you know, you'll be fine. Library's good for you. So what, what I like about what you shared and again, you, you've dug your heels in and done everything you've talked about in just about 12 months time, which is quite an accomplishment. Yeah. You know, and now looking back, I'm like, wow, I really got this done because 12 months ago it was like a pipe dream just for these small changes, um, which turned out to be big changes. And, um, you know, but I, I was able to kind of garner the support for it and, you know, get people excited about it. You know, there's always people come in who, you know, have, I think the first comment when I brought the chairs in was who ordered these ugly chairs from somebody. <laughs> and I just looked and said, me, um, you know, but most people are like, Oh, this is great. It's school colors. You know, clearly the, the school colors don't go with the current um, theme of the library space that was designed years ago. Um, the well, first, it's got that you nice know, oak and yeah, burgundy well, floor. Well, yeah, no, no, it's not burgundy. It's green. It's like is a it green? sea foam green floor. I've only been in here like twice. Yeah, so basically the the library is seafoam green, um, you know, or jade green, I don't even know, I'm not good at colors, but... Maybe when it was new. (laughs) It's a green, and it's great, and all the tables are green, and the circulation desk is this gargantuan thing from, like, a long time ago. And, um, you know, so the colors look great and everything, but it has nothing to do with the school other than this really beautiful mural that's behind my desk. So um, the chairs I ordered are red and blue that play off. I didn't want to do white. Um, The school colors are red and white with, like, an accent of blue. So I didn't want to do red and white because white's very, you know, easily get dirty. So you always think long term in libraries, what's going to not break, what's not going to be ruined um, over time because it is expensive. So I did uh, blue and red and, and, you know, different things. So like, you know, even the kids come in and classes and they're like, oh, the blue versus the red. You know, it's like cute to see that. And then the goal is, you know, for painting and changing colors to kind of have more neutral colors like grays and and kind of tie into the rest of the school. Um, you know, so the, the other interesting thing is the fact that in all these changes that you've made, you didn't once bring up the idea of, I have this budget. I have to put in my maker space as much of, you know, a fad as that is, I I shouldn't say a fad, but a lot of people, you know, they, they focus on that where your style of librarianship, you've done the maker space before in a previous school, but I, you're grounded in research and the academic part of it. Well, for me too, um, you know, makerspaces are great. And like you said, I've, I've created makerspace in one school and then it, the other school, it became a makerspace and they kind of got rid of the library. Um, so 
I've experienced kind of both extremes of makerspace, and I definitely hope to eventually incorporate that one day um, into my library. But I guess I'm not. It's, a, but it's not like the be all. I'm end not all. a trendy person. For me, like I, I feel like a library um, should be a place. Like I want students to learn about libraries and use libraries for the rest of their life. I want them to be a lifelong learner. I want them not to be afraid to go to their local library and ask a librarian a question and look up information that they don't know anything about. Um, so for me, like I want to reach out and do research and, you know, and it's also about college and careers. Like, you know, you're going to go to college. Those are the buzzwords, <laughs> college and career ready. Well, yeah, you know, 21st century student, but, um, yeah. So I mean, like, I feel like in some senses I'm an old school librarian, but I'm new school because I don't, I don't live inside my books and I'm not like, well, this is the only part of my library that's important because I totally, I forwent books to buy computers. Um, you know, but. And I'm all about technology, but I feel like there's a good balance. And that's the thing right now, like even in my current library, like the librarian who was there before me was awesome at nonfiction and the fiction and the collections are great. So I knew I could forego that for a year and not really lose a lot other than keeping up with some popular, you know, lit and things that people have needed. But, you know, I knew I could I could kind of put that away for a year. I've worked in libraries where I've had like one twenty fifth of the budget I currently have. So being able to have a budget where I can kind of work with it a little bit, um, you know, and, and fill those gaps where I can't get that from other departments, um, is great. So, but again, like now I want to look more at, at databases. I put in, you know, a bunch of databases and research and things because as teachers have come to me and projects have come up and people have been looking for information on things, um, you know, and even, even as like, we have a great middle school librarian who I know is teaching research and doing a lot of great things, you know, I had a lot of freshmen in the last couple of weeks and it's like, OK, great. Like, I know you're using this stuff. And if I keep that going and, and keep in in connection with your teachers, you know, you guys are going to be in for the next four years. Like, this is great. We can build upon it. We can show you new databases so that when you go to college, you know, because I mean, I don't know about you, but I actually never in my undergrad career took a class with a college librarian to learn anything about databases or research. None of my professors said, hey, show up to the library this time. This is what we're going to do. Well, being a history major, I actually did you did? That, oh, that's like cool. Like twice at William Patterson. Yeah, no, yeah. I never, um, I guess maybe communications, they didn't care. We didn't need to research. I don't know. But yeah, so I didn't um, ever experience a librarian at all at college, um, other than maybe occasionally asking some questions. But maybe it's who I was very comfortable researching myself and I was interested in it. But so, you know, I, but I want them to know some things because even now I work at, at the community college level and I have students coming in all the time and I'm like, you know, oh, this would be great. Like you would know how to do this if, if you remembered it from high school or you had like somebody show you this previously. And, and a lot of the databases we're using, they're using at the college level. So it's great to say, hey, here's, you know, they can see it a few times. And then, you know, when they get to the college level, yeah, they're not going to remember to go to click here, go here, step this, step that. But they're going to say, oh, I've heard that before. Oh, I've seen that before. You know, it's not going to be a complete, like, I have no clue what you're talking about. They'll remember those research methods. Yeah, and I've had students from um, previous schools who've graduated and gone on to college. You know, it's nice to get those emails or, you know, have those lunch meetings where they're like, oh, my God, thank you so much for showing me X, Y, Z. I remember it. You know, or it was great, or I still use the passwords from high school. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because I try to make things uh, simple for everybody to remember. But, you know, that was what I mean, that was another thing as a, you know, my sense as a redesign, I changed all the passwords in the entire databases for that the middle school and high school used to be all the same thing. That was very simple, non-numerical, you know, so they didn't have to have a password sheet. It's just, hey, remember this. And, and it also cuts it. down on kids coming up to the circulation desk saying, Mrs. Nessie, what's the password for this database? Yeah, or I mean, I even had, when I first started, I had parents calling. I mean, I, it took me a while to find out the passwords to the database because they weren't like they were on, you know, some pamphlets and things. But I actually had to call the companies and say, what is my password? What are my links? How do I set up my website? Because there was nothing um, kind of currently set up um, when I had gotten there. So I kind of had to figure it all out. Um, and then I found that there was stuff set up, but it just wasn't out where I had, could find it. So... Anyway, so I mean, but I actually had like a couple parents call me throughout, throughout the school day. Like, you know, my son was trying to get on the database. We have no clue. And I'm like, okay, hold on. Let me figure it out. So, you know, after a couple of those things, I was like, yeah, I know I totally can do this. And I've done that in previous schools. Um, and again, it goes back to that one library I worked with, with a really awesome librarian who, you know, all of her stuff was the same and simple and, and easy to remember. And I was like, oh, why don't we do this? Like, this would be great. So I've done that in a couple of schools now where it's really made a difference. But... um, yeah, I just, 
I like redesigning libraries. I don't know. I like change. I think it's definitely, I've gotten used to the criticism of change. People don't like change, um, especially in education. People They're like all about change. change. Of, I mean, how, how often does the furniture in our house move around? <laughs> I just uh, re-de- re-de- uh, not redecorated. <laughs> I kind of you moved the stuff around. I moved all of our furniture around uh, last Monday, so you know I don't I don't change the kitchen up as much. But, um, but when yeah, you do, you, you sure know, get excited. I, I kind of get an urge, and it's like you know what the function is not working. So let's move this. Let's move that. You know, we had all the kids' toys in the living room. Well, that was driving me crazy at night. So you know, I can't relax with a cup of tea and stare at toys all over the place. Even though Miles does a great job cleaning up. Um, so it was like, okay, let's move this all to the other room and let's put a chair out and let's try to make it a little bit more organized. And it actually was great because he's no longer distracted by the toys when he's eating dinner because they're not in the living room right next door. They're in a different room. So it's just been great. And then I just think when kids come over and play, like they can make a mess in that side room and I can just turn the light out <laughs> and worry about it the next day. And I think but, that's very, it mirrors what you've done in your library because again, I've seen it a couple times in person, you know. Carrying yeah, some of your I supplies take the in. before and after pictures, but and and your before and after pictures again over the last month or even just before the holiday break, you know you've done a lot, and you're the librarian who yeah, I only just came back in November, but I was like, yes, okay, now we're gonna get this done. We got we have stuff we have to get done. I have my computer's here. We're getting tables coming. We're getting the chairs. Let's go. And you sent me pictures where I, maybe somebody took the picture of you where you're you're down on the ground. You're oh my god, yeah, outlets and like crazy <laughs> and. You're, yeah, you're right in there. Worker, Frank. I was like, take a picture of me. I'm like nine months pregnant, laying on the floor, like hooking up wires. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I get in there myself, um, which isn't always the best thing. But, you know, my maintenance staff is great. The technology staff is great. So, but sometimes I'm like, let me just fix something for somebody right now. Like, there's no reason I have to put in a work order for this. I can do it. Um, again, I want it to function. So, you know, when I showed up, I think there was like 19 out of... 30 computers that had signs on them that said not working. And I was like, what is going on here? That's just crazy. And I, you know, and it's probably because just nobody was there to like put in a work order. So, you know, the person who was in charge of technology wasn't aware of it. So it wasn't like they weren't doing anything. It was just nobody knew. Nobody was, you know, somebody was just putting signs up. So um, it's actually funny. A couple of weeks ago, a teacher mentioned me. They're like, wow, you're like keeping everything working in here. I'm like, well, yeah, the second I have a problem with it, I mean, Chromeboxes work pretty well themselves, but working in my previous experience where I pretty much, you know, learned how to whitewash them and clean them up. Um, I'm sorry, power wash them, (laughs) Um, you know, and fix them and and register them and everything else. Like I was like, yeah, this, I mean, I haven't had to do that for any of these computers, but it's like, yeah, it's, it's, you know, they're a lot easier to manage, but also even the old stuff, it's like the second somebody's like, this isn't working, this is a problem, or I've even fixed student accounts where I've, you know, quickly, I'm like, okay, let me put a work order in. And, like, usually by the next day, they come back at lunch, and they're like, oh, I can get in now. I'm like, can, you know, and I always remember the face, the name, and I'm like, hey, so-and-so, does this still work? You know, did you, did you have a problem with this? Did you get it to print? Did you, you know, get into your account? Um, you know, so, and I've even had people from guidance call me, and they're like, do you know how to fix this? Or, you know, so... Again, it's to me. I need a library that functions. If it doesn't function, they they have no need for me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just a room <laughs> to hang out as a community, you know. So it's a community space and technology and books and information. And I just want people to feel comfortable going to library. And then hopefully, as they go on in life, you know, because my my basis is in public librarianship. So, you know, I want you to go to the library. Use your library. That's what it's there for. And the more you use it, the more funding they get, and the more support they can give you. Um, you know, it's funny with, with economic times and we talked about frugal stuff and a lot of times when people are hard, you know, on hard times, they go to their library and that's usually when everything gets cut for libraries. Yeah. <laughs> so the more you can support your libraries, the better, you know? So I want, I want students that I work with to become lifelong learners. So again, the redesign just helps them get in that mindset of this is a place to come. This is a place to enjoy. And this is a place to learn. So Based on everything you've shared and what you've been able to do in multiple libraries, my takeaway from what you just talked about overall uh, is that a lot of what you talk about with functionality and making changes, it doesn't just have to apply to libraries. That's what I'm learning. You know, for for you in the classroom, you know, maybe it's changing up your desk, changing the, mm-hmm. the physical layout of your space to try and one, it just kind of maybe keeps your kids on their toes, but that can also kind of change the... The, the feng shui or the energy well, that, yeah in your room. well you know in my last experience i worked with a really awesome art teacher and she taught me about feng shui and you know kind of taught me about the different areas and 
spaces and things to focus on and the energy, um, you know, which sometimes I've done in our house and, and learning about it. And so I kind of bring that into like even with my current library redesign, like in previous, it was like I just redesigned it to like fit what I needed. Um, and in this go around, people are like, wow, it, it just flows better in here. And it's like, yeah, like, you know, I was thinking about where's the energy going? Like when you come in, where do you, lo- you know, where do you gravitate towards? What are the feeling you're going to get when you walk in the door? And she taught me that, you know, she taught me like, hey, if you have kids just like sitting and hanging out in this little spot by the door, that's the energy is going to come through the door and it's not going to be, you know, a learning space or this type of space. And I'm like, oh my God, that's like, makes sense. You know, so I've kind of shifted things or like my quick print station, like here's people quick in and out and and getting what they need to do do, and focus, you know, they're standing there focusing when you walk in the door to get what they're, what they need to do. So, um. Yeah. So the feng shui is like a huge thing. And I think in a classroom, you could do the same thing is kind of experience those, you know, the corners and the spaces and, and figure out how they can work in teaching a lesson. Or for me, again, assess the situation, what's working, what's not working, and how can I change, you know, what little bit can I do in my little piece of the world to make a difference and change the situation. And I always have to keep in mind, like, luckily in a classroom, somebody doesn't have to worry about administration using it all the time. But you know, I always have to keep in mind, there are board meetings that happen there, you know, in my one library, every board meeting was in my library. Um, You know, so when I moved tables and shifted things around, it was like, well, I still need to have this space for them to have their coffee and water and whatever for their meetings. And, you know, so um, depending on, you know, where I'm at and how they're using it, you know, the form and function and, and purpose, you know, I have to be available from everybody from a club that wants to meet in the library to a class I'm teaching research to, to, you know, a board of ed meeting and, you know, parent involvement in the space as well. So it's kind of a whole community space. So in a classroom, it's kind of even better because it's your own little world unless you share it with somebody else. Um, you know, but you can kind of adjust that and fit what you need to to make your life function better. And one more question before we move out of this area. One, first, I've, I've gathered that what you're most proud of is what you've been able to do for the function of your library and how it works. So I want to ask you, or I'm going to ask you, what's the next big challenge or thing that you're looking forward to making impact in, in your library? Um, well, like I said recently, the, for me, it's the academic part. Um, last year, not one person, I mean, one person was like, could you maybe tell my kids a little bit about a tool online, you know, but like nobody really was seeking me out for any type of educational purposes. And it was like, oh, Okay. Um, you know, so for me, it was like forging those relationships, uh, with colleagues and getting them to trust me and, and understand what I know and what I can help them with. Um, so like I said, you know, I'm, next year I'm hoping to invest more in databases and, and be more available for every subject area and get people in using the library. So like, great, now I've made it functional and to fit your purpose and your form. And, you know, a lot of people have laptop carts and everything else, but I still want you to come in and use the gotta space. Gotta get people in the door. <laughs> yeah, I gotta get people in the door. So you know, so I, I still want to have, you know, I want to focus in on the education piece and what I can share and teach. Um, you know, it was a lot of fun. And I have a couple little fun things that I do with students um, and closing activities and like, you know, things. So I have a good time teaching. You know, I always get nervous. I'm not a born teacher, but, um, you know, so I think that's my focus. You know, hopefully still renovations. You know, if we can do painting, I'd love to kind of shrink my um, circulation desk. I think we probably could fit eight people behind it. Um, and we have at times. So, you know, and teachers love sitting back there, which is fine. It's totally cool. But I would love to shrink that and kind of open up some space maybe for a little maker space or for some other um, aspects of the library that might be fun or useful for different groups that come in. Or I would love to add, um, we have a games club that's in every week. And I would love to add, you know, like a chess table. Like I've worked in libraries, school libraries, where they've had like a set chess table and they've had this and, you know, you know. Uh, my previous you used to work in a library where like the chess boards were glued to the table or was it built into the table? No, it was top? like a chess table. It was like a legit, like the table was built with a chess thing on top and oh, okay. like, they could come and like trade in their phone and get the chess pieces kind of thing. And, and I mean, the kids were like hardcore about the game. And, and for me, it's like such a thinking game. I'm like, this is like such a library style um, game, but we have like a games club and stuff that's in. So like, I would love to have something like kids can come at lunch and play chess you know, um, or build on a Lego table. Yeah. Or, yeah. Cause I had that at one, at the place where I had started a maker space, we'd create a whole Lego table and they loved that. And I could um, build it for you. And I had little, uh, yeah, I had challenges and stuff. So, you know, I would just love for them to be there and just doing something a little bit different than their normal, 
you know, papers and, you know, just kind of, I don't know, something to free their mind and, and use it in a different way, kind of to expand their brain. Cause, and maybe put their phone down and, you know, interact with somebody and challenge somebody. And Yeah, God forbid we have kids <laughs> talking face-to-face with another human being or even Scary. adults. Sometimes we yeah. ourselves yeah. Uh, you know, get we, too buried. We all struggle with it. We, we, I think we all struggle with those little devices that can get in the way. But yeah, so my next things are, you know, hopefully I can continue renovations, maybe painting, carpet, you know, some other design stuff. Um, definitely, you know, shifting collection stuff. So it's better for our staff and hopefully bringing in some, you know, mind, you know, mind challenging games and, and different things. So, you know, over time, like I have plans over the next couple of years to kind of shift and change and, and adapt to what the school needs and what, you know, and that's pretty much what the library is there for. It's there to adapt to whatever is important to the school and, and keep it funded. And I'm kind of the squeaky wheel. So <laughs> I try not to be too squeaky, but I basically, you know, put myself out there. And, you know, last year I was able to teach even the administrators and their support, a lot of Google apps and stuff and, and help them. So, you know, you help other people and they're more interested in helping you. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for giving us more insight into how you do what you do in the library. And now it's time for this episode's House of Ed Tech VIP. And this is special because I've never done it this way before. We have two, count them, two VIPs. So I want to give big shout outs and congratulations to this episode's VIPs, Steve and Kathy Isaacs. Steve teaches video game design and development at William Annan Middle School in Basking Ridge, New Jersey, and his wife, Kathy, teaches K through five technology integration and innovation in central New Jersey. And she is passionate about nurturing problem solvers through computer science, project based learning, and authentic use of technology. Kathy is a Google certified educator, and she's also a class dojo mentor. They've been married for many years, and they have two awesome daughters who really appear with them at a lot of the education conferences in New Jersey and most coffee EDU events. You need to connect with both of them on Twitter. Steve is on Twitter. His username is Mr. Underscore Isaacs, and that's MR underscore I S A A C S. And Kathy is on Twitter also, and her handle is I Wear the Crowns, I W E A R T H E C R O C H R O W N S. Connect with them both on Twitter today, and congratulations, Steve and Kathy. You are the House of Ed Tech VIPs. And that is going to do it, my dear, for a Valentine's Day. Well, that that's this episode of the House of Ed Tech. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh, thank you again to Domain.com for supporting this episode. If you would like to get some information about Audible or Domains for those free audiobooks, you can go to chrisnessy.com slash Audible. And if you're interested in purchasing inexpensive domains for your blog or website, then head over to chrisnessy.com slash domains and you could pick up your domain starting first year for $9.99 and that's a great deal. That's how I get chrisnessy.com, frugalmomster.com, which is Kate's new venture. So be sure to check that out too. Woohoo! Yeah. Um, and keep the conversation going. Visit the website, chrisnessy.com. If you'd like to get access to all the show notes, you can go to chrisnessy.com slash 54, as in episode 54. And the show notes are there and will contain all the links and information that I shared, Kate shared, and we shared, and uh, about everybody who participated in this episode. I'd love to connect with you and hear your thoughts and feedback, and so would Caitlin. Absolutely. You can share your feedback on chrisnessy.com. Click the feedback button. Connect with me on Twitter. I'm Mr. Nessie. Use the hashtag House of Ed Tech. Caitlin, where can people connect with you on Twitter? Uh, Kate Nessie, K-A-T-E-N-E-S-I. And uh, if you just want um, 
the Frugal Momster post. I'm not really sure how much I'll be interacting on Twitter there to start off with, but I'll be forwarding my blog to Frugal Momster on Twitter. Very cool. And again, also, don't forget about the new segment. Send questions to me. Send questions to Kate. Again, we got the microphones. We got the equipment. We can both do it. Uh, send us your questions. Use the hashtag House of Ed Tech. You can vox me on Mr. Nessie or the feedback phone number is 732-903-4869. Now, if you enjoyed the House of Ed Tech in Caitlin, how could anybody not enjoy this program? It's fantastic. You're a lot of fun to listen to. <laughs> First thing you can do is tell somebody about the podcast. Tell a coworker, tell your supervisor, tell your principal. Heck, email your superintendent and tell them they should give my show a listen. Also, rate and review the podcast on iTunes. Your positive rating and honest review will help keep the podcast front and center for others to enjoy. On the next episode of the podcast, I will maybe have Caitlin back on. I don't know yet. I'm not sure. But that episode will come out number 55 on February 28th, 2016. Thanks again. Thanks for joining us. Well, that's what happens when the music runs longer than <laughs> what I was going to say. Um, but remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try. Do that again. Well, that's the fun of trying to talk and, you know, kind of do this live where the music runs longer than what I thought it was going to. So let's do this the right way. Thank you for joining me. And remember, using technology isn't difficult. Give it a try. <laughs> Thank you, dear. And uh, we'll have you back again. It will. The House of Ed Tech is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. The Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators. <laughs> podcasts by educators. For more, go to edupodcastnetwork.com.